one of the most important properties about systems of linear equations is that they have only either zero, one, or infinitely many different solutions. So those are the three different possibilities that we could have. And what I'm going to do in this video is I have an example of each of them. And previously, while we've seen how to deal with what happens if there's just a unique solution, we are going to do these row operations and try to turn that into its upper triangular form. I'm going to show you in this video how we deal with the other cases, when there's infinitely many solutions or when there's no solutions. So let's do the one on the left first. Now, all three of these matrices look almost the same. They're a two by two system as in two variables and two different equations. And they're mostly ones, but possibly just with one zero. And you're gonna see that it's really sensitive. Small little differences like one one turns into a zero can make all the difference between zero one or infinitely many solutions. So remember our first goal is to try to put a zero here. We have this sort of leading one on the top and we want to put a zero underneath it. That's our ideal form. So I'm gonna continue in that vein. And what I want to do is to put a zero there is I'm going to take the second row and I'm going to put in place of it the second row minus the first row. So that doesn't change the first row at all. I can just copy and paste the first row. But then if I'm trying to subtract the, the first row from the second row, I go one minus one is zero, one minus one is zero, and zero minus one is minus one. So this is what happens when I try to reduce this particular matrix. However, if I read off the bottom row here, what this tells me is that 0x1 plus 0x2 is equal to minus 1. In other words, it's telling me that, that 0 is equal to minus 1. This cannot be. There is no x1 and x2 that has the property that this linear combination of them is going to be equal to minus 1. So this tells me that I have no solutions. Or another way to write it is to say that it is inconsistent. All right, let's look at the second one. So same process, I'm gonna focus on trying to put a zero in this location. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take my second row and in its place, I'm gonna take the second row minus the first row. And again, that does not change the first row, but now I go one minus one is zero, one minus one is zero, and one minus one, one last time, is one more zero. Now, there's something sort of interesting to note here. If I look at this bottom equation in this scenario, right, so if I look at the bottom row, this is a totally pointless row. It just tells me that zero x one plus 0x2 is just equal to 0. Well, well, duh, it, it doesn't matter. I'm not getting any new information. Or another way to put it on it is I'm not putting any constraint on the variables x1 or x2. In a sense, I have a little bit of freedom here that, that normally I had two different equations that would constrain my variables, but, but now I only have one equation that's constraining them, the first of them. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to let x2, it could have been x1, but I'm going to let x2. And I'm going to let x2 equal to s. And when I do this, I'm thinking of s as just some arbitrary free parameter. So this s is a free parameter. It could be anything. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what x1 is in terms of this parameter, which could be anything. So I'm going to say, therefore, from the first row, x1 plus x2 is equal to 1, so in other words, x1 plus that, that value that I'm substituting in, which is s is equal to 1, or in other words, x1 is equal to 1 minus s. So if I take those things together, what you'll notice is that there are infinitely many possible solutions. Infinitely many solutions. Why? Well, Choose any number s you might like. How about 100? Then that can be my x2, and my x1 is going to be 1 minus 100, or minus 99 in this case. So for any value s that you can get, we get a pair x1, x2, which is going to solve this system of linear equations. And so the idea is effectively, when you have these zero rows that don't put any constraint, then you get some freedom, and you just make one of these variables, in this case the x2, a so-called free variable or a free parameter. It can just be any arbitrary symbol s. 
And then you figure out what the other variables can be in terms of that free parameter s. And then in this final one, it's already in that form that I want to have where I've got a, a leading one here and then a zero beneath it and then another leading one here. I actually don't need to do anything. It's already in its ideal situation. And I can just read off. So if I look down at the second equation, I get x2 is equal to 1. So that's one answer. And then from the first equation, I get x1 plus x2 is equal to 1. So in other words, x1 plus 1 is equal to 1, or in other words, x1 is equal to 0. So in other words, I'm going to just get one solution, a unique solution. So the key difference between these three examples is that after I do my row operations, to put it in that ideal upper triangular form, the bottom rows look very different. On the first one, it was all zeros with a variable and then a non-zero constant. In the second one, it was all zeros, both in the coefficients and in the constant. And then in the final one, it was all zeros, but there was that one non-zero coefficient and the non-zero constant. And that gave us the unique solution. So it's all about reducing it down to these uh, ideal forms, looking at these rows and saying, is there a contradiction there? Is there a freedom there? Or is there a unique solution?